Thank you, Philip. And just again to say welcome to this special Advent celebration. If you haven't been to one of these first Sunday celebrations, a special welcome to you. First of December, very first day of Advent. I don't know how many of you have your Advent calendars or have one in the household or ever had one as a child. How many of you ever use an Advent calendar? Look at that, most of you, eh? So, uh, 1st of December for the next 24 days. Now, the Advent calendar, in fact, its origins right back in the 17th century in, in Europe. It began as an Advent clock, in fact, which was 24 candles that were lit one each day for the 24 days up to Christmas Eve. And then the first Advent calendar, I think, was 1851, a handmade calendar with little windows that opened up. But originally, it was a story calendar. So each window gave you a little another episode of the nativity story, and you would go through those pictures. Over the years, they have uh, changed, and uh, these days, are little pouches with chocolates and all sorts of things in as well for each day. But uh, uh, And they used to be the other way around. We tend to start with the 1st of December as number one, then number two. But they used to start with number 24 was the first, and then it was a countdown, 24, 23, 22, finally to 3, 2, 1. One Christmas, you know. But the whole essence of it was a sense of, of anticipation, of expectation, which is what Advent is all about. It's these days leading up to Christmas and the sense of a joyful expectation, anticipation of that great event. And indeed, as we look around the Christmas story, we find this was a significant part of that Christmas story. And in fact, in Luke 2, we're going to read a few verses in a moment, but it tells us the story of uh, two people particularly who are waiting, not just 24 days. Boy, they've been waiting, one of them, for more than 24 years, every day of their life, with that sense of anticipation. Let's just read a little bit about them. This is Simeon in Luke chapter 2, and I'm reading just a few verses. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required. Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen the salvation of the Lord. Father, we pray now that you would come by your Holy Spirit, that same Holy Spirit who came upon Simeon, who moved him to go into the temple that day. Give to us a sense of expectation, your purposes in our lives, Lord, that sense of your Holy Spirit stirring us with a sense of expectancy of what you want to be doing today in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Simeon and Anna were both characters that we see in, in Luke 2 who had been their advent, that whole period of expectation, anticipation. But some of it had been years, and it wasn't easy for them. Even folk were just sitting around. They'd had difficult lives for Anna. She'd got married, and uh, her husband had died when they were just seven years of marriage. She was now 84 years of age. So you imagine, all those years, it said, she'd been waiting and longing for the coming of the Christ. Now remember, for centuries, people had had that expectation. But here in this generation, God was raising up by his spirit and stirring a sense of expectation that the Christ was to come. What must it have been for Simeon to have felt a promise of God upon his life? That Simeon, you will not see death until your eyes see the Christ. Imagine that. For thousands of years, people had been expecting the promises. But here in this generation now, there is a sense of expectation for Simeon. How is he going to know? How, what would he look like? How would he recognize him? There were hundreds of babies being brought in and out of the temple. How do you know he'd be there at the right time or the right day? But just as the Holy Spirit had witnessed that with him, so on this particular day, it says, he was moved by the Holy Spirit to go into the temple. And as he went into the temple, so the Holy Spirit came upon him. And as Mary and Joseph brought in the baby, he knew this was the one. That sense of expectation and yet that prompting of God's spirit. In our lives, I wonder what you feel by way of, is God saying to you that you're going to achieve before you see death? What's the sense of purpose that God has for your life? For each of our lives, God has a purpose. For Simeon, it was a sense of God saying, before you die, you're going to see the Christ. What has God said to you about your life? What's your expectation? What's your anticipation? How real daily in our lives do we live with that prompting of God's Holy Spirit of the unfolding of his purposes? 
that sense of recognizing God's hand at work in our life as we anticipate that. But some of you might say, but Rob, for them it was an anticipation because Jesus had not yet come. But for us, Jesus has come now. So what's our expectation? That's where I want to come to our second reading. And this is from Acts chapter 1 and just reading from verse 8. And this is um, uh, Acts 1 verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Same promise of the Holy Spirit coming on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he, that's Jesus, having risen from the dead and appeared to his disciples, after he said this, he was taken up from their their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Here is this amazing promise for these first disciples that the Jesus that they had witnessed, his ministry and life, his death, his resurrection, now as they witness his ascension to heaven, the promise was that this same Jesus will so come in the same way as you have seen him see. As he disappeared in those clouds with gaping mouths and gazing eyes, they'd watch Jesus ascend before them and suddenly this message, this same Jesus shall so come in the same way as you have seen him go. You say, but Rob, this is 21st century. This is 2,000 years later. You don't believe that still, I mean, uh, were they mistaken to have believed that? I mean, the first generation and those generations that followed, was it somehow that, that they were misguided? And Because uh, we're now here 2,000 years later. No. It's God's intention that every generation should live with this expectation. The way I illustrate it sometimes is a bit like a, a long journey walk and there are two ways you might walk you might be doing a cross-country walk or you might do one of those coastal walks suppose the walk is going to be from John O'Groats to Land's End you set out it's going to be a long journey and as you go it's going to be a long way many days but eventually eventually you're going to get to the end Land's End the land will end there'll be a cliff and you'll see the sea and you know you've got there this is it like a promise that one day one day Jesus is coming and as you go maybe it's a bit disillusioned at times because you see this great stretch of water. You don't realize you've just got to the Lake District, in fact, and the sea's still a long way to go. And then you get a bit further on. It's one of those hot, sunny days, and there's a, there's a, a, a kind of a sense in which, you know, you, you suddenly have those illusions, uh, you know, of mirages on the road and water, and you think, I've got there, but no, you haven't. And uh, is it like that then? Were previous generations just misguided because they lived with that expectation? Is it just one of those journeys where, you know, over the hill you think it's going to be there, but it's not there? No, it's not like that. It's much more like a coastal walk. Let's suppose it was from Dover across, along the south coast to Land's End, where in fact every day the sea is in view. Every day you smell the sea air. Every day you hear the waves. Every day we're meant to live with the expectation. Every day we're made to live that sense. Maranatha, even so come, Lord Jesus. Some of you know and you often smile. Every day of my life, every day of my life, I wake up in the morning, my first things I pray is this, is it today, Lord? Every day, many, many years. My children used to joke sometimes when we were on holiday, said, have you asked if it's today, Dad? Yeah, yeah, every day. I want to live my life with this sense of expectation. Why? That's what the scripture says. Seeing that all these things are going to happen, then what manner of life should we live in a whole holiness of living It somehow brings a challenge to our living, that kind of radical discipleship which so often we lose sight of. Some of you here today, tonight, if I was that x-ray in which I could look into every detail of your life, and for some of you, there's all sorts of checkered things that be going on. Someone here tonight is in the midst of an affair, but no one else knows about it. You've many a time been meaning to stop it, but it just somehow keeps going. But if you knew if you knew that at midnight tonight, Jesus was coming again. What would it mean to you? What would you want to put right? Some folk with those secret habits in our life, for some, whether it's pornography and 
Some are a habit you keep meaning to break and yet days go by and months go by and years go by and it's still there. You never seem to break it. You've got your little secret cache of, uh, of pornographic literature or websites and it's somehow it's still there. But you know, if you lived your life conscious that it could be today, it shapes our living, it shapes the way we live, our attitude to life. Not just some of those more kind of overt things, but even those secret areas of life for some where we hold resentment. Maybe it's someone that we know we've wronged and days have gone by, months have gone by, years have gone by. We've never put it right. People have wronged us. We felt res res resentment and bitterness. It's become a root of bitterness. Whenever their name is mentioned, there's a whole association that brings anger. Yet we live with it. The challenge often in our Western world and our Christianity, there's this kind of armchair, anemic sort of Christianity where we live with all sorts of things we know are so far short of what it lived, meant to be. You read a book like Watchman Nee's Normal Christian Life, think, goodness me, if that's normal, you know, that's normal, yeah, that's what it's meant to be. But we live so far short of it. Why? Because we've lost this sense sometimes. That's why for those early disciples the challenge was that he would live in the light of his coming. It was so evident. You know, Jesus, his own disciples, when he says to them at that stage, you know, uh, I'm going to prepare a place for you. There are many rooms in my father's house and I'm going to prepare a place for you. Now, even that in itself is something I feel of... You know, we live life sometimes where there's such a fear of death and we're very conscious at the moment of several folks who are terminally ill, humanly speaking. Yet sometimes we think so much of what we're gonna miss, but there's so much that's been prepared for us. And the perspective of life sometimes we lose. And Jesus says, you know, in my Father's house there are many rooms and, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. I honestly am, if it were not, so I tell you if I wasn't. If there wasn't, I tell you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, then I will come back and take you to be with me where I am. That promise of Jesus, those words in John 14 and then again here in Acts 1, is the last glimpse the disciples had of Jesus, the last moments they saw of him here as he ascended was this amazing promise, this same Jesus shall so come in the same manner as you have seen him go into heaven just as he disappeared in those clouds. And so it became for the early church, this sense of expectancy and anticipation. And as the years went by, even for the early church was a challenge because, you know, was it gonna be like those days from uh, a kind of death to resurrection to ascension, just another 50 days, and then, oh, how long would it be? And then some, some of those early believers, they had died. And Jesus had not yet come back, so what was going to happen now? It's amazing, you know, I remember many years ago, visiting the Holy Land, I've told you the story I'm sure before, but uh, visiting a fascinating area just outside Jerusalem, it's known as the Tobias Tomb area. It's a place, you know, in those days, particularly if you were wealthy enough, you would have a, 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 a tomb which was one of those caves, just like Jesus' tomb is described, where often they would put a, a big stone across it and they'd seal it with the family seals. But Jerusalem had been sacked so many times, had been invaded, and so the first place when invaders come, they would sack the tombs and take away anything that had been buried with the family, they're kind of, they often buried with them some of those treasures, they were, they were taken just like you read some with Tutankhamun and those sort of things, but in Jerusalem that. So it's rare that you'd ever find still a tomb with an unbroken seal. And back in the 1940s, in fact, they found a tomb in Jerusalem in the area of Tobias. It's a remote area on the edge of Jerusalem. And they found a tomb the seals of which had never been broken. Imagine that, it's in the 1940s. People gathered from all around the world, journalists and archeologists, cynics and all sorts. The breaking of those, breaking of those seals on the tomb. Because from the outside dating of the tomb, it looked as if this tomb had dated right back to the first century. Right about the middle of the first century. Now unless everybody in the tomb, they were family tombs, had died below the age of 30, then it meant that some of these people buried inside this tomb that had never been touched for 2,000 years, would have been alive when Jesus was alive? Would there be any mention, any reference to him, any, any sense as they buried their dead? And when they broke open those tombs, it was documented, you can see it in fact in the museum, the museum they have documentation on it, and uh, it was fascinating as those archeologists and journalists, and they, they went inside, and inside there were four, they used to have inlets into the side of the, of, of the cave, as it were, where they would put the bone caskets. And there were five of them, a family of five, each of them had their, but the caskets had long ago decayed, and everything else had decayed around it. 
So it was little that you could be able to, to test the remnants. But then they noticed the inscriptions over the first and the third of the tombs. Over the first of the tombs was inscribed, Yesu Eu. Those words meant Jesus, help. And then over the third of the tombs, Jesus, let him arise. Here was somebody burying their dead who'd been alive in Jerusalem when Jesus rose from the dead and was actually crying out, as it were, and appealing, Lord, let him arise, believing he had power over death within that very generation. There was something about that first generation who lived in an expectation. But now, when we come to Thessalonians, and in every chapter of Thessalonians, every chapter, you have this reference again to the coming again of Jesus. In chapter four, it particularly deals with the question of those who are now beginning to feel concerned because people had died, and Jesus had not yet come back. And so he's, I don't want you to be ignorant, he says, of those who've already died. They're not gonna miss out. Then he says, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with this catastrophic sound, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And those of us who are still alive at that moment will be together in the air. That sense of expectation. I know sometimes we lose the sense of challenge, not just to our own discipleship and that holiness of living, but the urgency in communicating this good news of the Lord Jesus. It's the dead in Christ that will rise first, those that have died in Jesus. But that moment when it happens, it says, and it gives this amazing description, it says that there'll be two people grinding in the field, working. One will be taken, one will be left. There'll be two people asleep in bed, one will be taken, one will be left. Now imagine, this was a time when even the perception of the day as far as a spherical earth and night and day was unknown. And yet at that moment, there would be day and night. For some, they'd be working in the field, for others, they'd be asleep. At that moment, when it would happen, and it would be urgent, there'd be a suddenness about it. He says it'll be like a thief in the night. For those who perhaps sometimes comfort themselves by saying, well, Rob, I know I'm not old, but I'm sure we'll get an announcement one Sunday that you know, in two weeks' time it's gonna happen. It won't happen like that. There'll be no announcement. In fact, it'll be like a thief in the night, in a moment. That's why the whole story and the parable that Jesus told of the virgins with their oil. What does it mean for us to be living our lives in the fullness of the Holy Spirit, with oil in our lamps, ready, looking for, living in the fullness of God's purposes, that sense of expectancy for our lives and what God has promised for our life. Whether it's we would see the Christ, what is it for you that God has promised? What's the seeds that God's put into your life? It's not just the things that we may be doing that don't please God, but what's the things we've left undone? What's the purposes God has had for your life, what he's given you a sense of promise, of purpose, sense of call upon your life, you never quite got round to it. You're always going to, but you never quite got round to it. It's that sense of urgency in what we communicate. Now I know you may say, but Rob, this is 21st century, Rob. This is age of worldwide web and traveling to the planets, yeah. But you know, it's almost as if you can sense sometimes the unfolding of God's purposes in history. You know, there are more promises for Jesus' second coming than there are for his first coming. And his first coming stretched over those thousands of years from the first promise to when it really happened. But when it did happen, it was a moment in history that could fulfill those purposes. What we know as the, uh, the Pax Romanus, it was the period of Roman Empire where they'd made the roads and the common language and even writing and script that had made it possible when they scattered to be able to touch out and out and out Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. Do you know... One of the signs for that coming again of the Lord Jesus is that this gospel shall be preached in all the earth. And then the end shall come. No generation has ever been closer to the fulfillment. We now have the world web. We now have a global village in which communication is such an amazing way in which we've been able to communicate. Here tonight, we are closer at this moment than anyone who has ever lived to the coming again of Jesus the challenge that brings. But the danger is that we live increasingly in a materialistic, cynical world. It's like as if as you get towards the end of scripture, it prepares you for it. And so when Peter writes his second letter, he writes like this. He says, I want you to understand that as you get close to that day, in those last days, 
scoffers will come. It'll be an age of cynicism and satire where people will scoff and they'll even say to you, where's the promise of his coming then? Why, you say he's going to come again, but everything's continued the same since the beginning. Why, 2,000 years ago they said that and here we are, 21st century. 1,000, 2,000 years have gone. And remember, this is in Second Peter, writing in those days, and he says this, I want you to understand that with the Lord, a thousand years is like one day. Goodness me. Talking of those last days when scoffers and cynics will come. I mean, if he'd said, you know, 10, ten years, but a thousand years is like one day. 2,000 years, why? In God's timetable, that was day before yesterday. So we say then, is it as slack as that? Is it as loose as that? So it could be another 10,000 years. No, 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 no. It's not loose. It's not slack. It's not just that God has lost a sense of time. God is unfolding his purposes. He's not willing that any should perish. His longing is constantly this gospel of the kingdom must reach the ends of the earth and then the end will come. That's when the Bible says amazing words sometimes that we can hasten his coming. How could we possibly hasten his coming? But because this gospel, as it reaches to the corners of the earth, been entrusted to us. It's a message of life. An urgency as we communicate that good news. Here as we begin Advent, as we live with that sense of expectancy and anticipation of Christmas, the first coming, there's a sense in which God is calling us to live in expectation and anticipation of his coming. Here comes the Son, Maranatha, even so come, Lord Jesus. What does it mean to say? What would it mean for you tomorrow? Just try it for one day. When you wake up tomorrow, you pull the curtains back. Just say these words. Is it today, Lord? Is it today? Somehow it shapes that day. Things you thought you had to do don't seem as important. Things you were intending to do, which you know you shouldn't have done. Take a different air. Somehow in your witness, whereas you've always meant to with a colleague at work or the neighbor, but you never quite get round to it. Here we come to Christmas, no better opportunity. No time when folk are more fertile and open. An opportunity for us to be able to invite, to be able to share that good news of the Lord Jesus. It's not a question of an optional extra, it's a sense of urgency. It's a sense of challenge, this gospel of the kingdom. <coughs> Jesus is coming again, and God wants us to live with a sense of advent, a sense of expectancy, a sense of anticipation. Let's stand again, I'm gonna pray, then hand back over to Dave. <laughs> Particularly want to sense tonight that we're not just hearers of the word, but wouldn't it be wonderful at this Christmas time for God by his Holy Spirit to stir in us like he did with Simeon, with Anna, a sense of expectancy for his coming that stirs us daily to want to live in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. To deal with things in our life that would grieve God's spirit if it were today. Things that we've left undone, broken relationships that somehow we've been meaning to put right but have put off. People that we may be the best person positioned to share that good news an urgency to make Jesus known. Come now, Lord. Come by your Spirit. Lord, for some of us here stood in your presence where our lamps are half empty, some of us almost drained, fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. That if it was tonight, Lord, we want you to come at a time when our lamps are full, burning bright, witnessing and sharing that life of Jesus, living in the fullness of the Holy Spirit, living with a sense of expectancy, of anticipation. Maranatha, even so come, Lord Jesus.